Good afternoon, everyone. This is Evelyn Mantilla coming to you from Access Health Connecticut. Welcome to today's webinar on the open enrollment extension. A little bit of housekeeping information. First of all, participants are automatically muted once you are logged in. Please keep your audio muted for the duration of the webinar. Questions will be reserved for the end of the webinar. Type any questions you may have into your chat box, which is located in the control panel and the presenter or special guest will answer the question. If you find your audio component experiencing any technical difficulties or wish to call in instead, please switch from audio to phone call in the control panel. You will be given a phone number and access code to dial in and listen to the webinar. And I would like to add one more piece in case anyone is experiencing this. If for some reason you are not able to see the full screen of our presentation, all you need to do is go to view options and click on fit to windows. Again, if you cannot see the full screen, uh, go to view options and then click on fit to window. So with that, we'd like to start today's webinar. Thank you for joining us uh, on behalf of Access Health Connecticut. We really appreciate you taking the time to be part of this conversation. Today, we're going to talk about the open enrollment extension and our presenter is going to be Deb Eastman, who is the enrollment manager here at Access Health Connecticut. Uh, so Deb, let me introduce you and get right into it. So welcome, Deb. Thank you, Evelyn. And good afternoon, CACs and brokers. We're going to talk all about open enrollment and what to do in the HICS system and then some of the pieces for um, our fairs and also our navigator sites. So the open enrollment extension is now December 16th, 2019 through January 15th, 2020. And what is the impact to our consumers? So it means we have more time to shop. The consumer has more time to shop, to switch plans in 2020. So if your consumer has picked a plan for January, they can stay in that plan. They just need to pay it um, to whatever carrier they had at the original plan um, for January, and then also pick a new plan and make sure that they um, pay that for the subsequent 11 months. So if you look at the, the plan B here and plan A, it lets you know there was their original plan for January at 150, and then it went to 100 uh, for February through December. And I think that's it for, for that piece. So we'll go to the next screen. So processing changes for 2020 and HICS. So there in the quick link spot on the second one down, report a change. So that needs to be clicked if they're reporting a change and not setting up a new um, plan for 2020. So you have to report a change and submit the application. Processing the change for 2020. So those are the reasons for the changes the drop down boxes. So you've got to pick one of those and um, depending on what the situation is, if it's a reported change for income or household change, you do have to select one in order to click to the next to submit the changes. So you, you pick that, the um, submit changes, click one and then go ahead and proceed to the next screen. So that's gonna give you the eligibility um, determination screen and those boxes have to be checked off for the individuals that are looking for coverage. Um, and just make sure when you're reading through that, the eligibility screen that you've picked the right ones for the right amount, the, excuse me, the right dates and then proceed to the next screen. So the enrollment disclaimers, they will be on that, the, subsequent screen after you pick the eligibility and um, the agents would be reading those over the phone, but then make sure that the consumer understands all the disclaimers and then you proceed to the next screen. So there in that box underneath the, the plan that they have chosen, there's a box and you would need to unclick that because that, that's telling them that they, they need to pick a different plan for the, um, 2020 QHP plans. Uncheck the box. Okay, so there again, you have to make sure that they're reading the disclaimer box and they're confirming it with a check mark in order to proceed. So this would be if a consumer wants to enroll that didn't um, 
pick a plan for 2020 yet. So they, you would go to the quick links, go down to the third box down, enroll in coverage, submit the application at, with a 2-1 effective date. So anything after 1215, the consumer will be getting a February 1st effective date. And here is where they would go if they need to set up a new account or any information that we have it would be www.accesshealthct.com, enroll now or create an account. So what's the impact to brokers and CACs? It's the 2020 plan selection would be for 2-1 effective date. Aid commissions would be during that extension period to brokers. Um, the limited promotion part, we will be promoting our fairs and libraries. So we do have um, the, the three navigator sites and then we also have the two libraries, which would be in Stanford and East Hartford Library. We will also have field support out at the navigator sites as well as the libraries and the fairs. So in-person assistance, so there's where our navigator sites are, Waterbury, New Opportunities in West Hartford and the dates, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but those are the dates for the holidays, their times and when they'll be closing early. Also the Stanford Library and East Hartford Library. So in-person assistant, here's our enrollment fair schedule. Um, we do have one uh, tonight. It's in Bristol, the Bristol Library, 1219, and then all the subsequent other fairs that are gonna be going on. And I do believe that the majority of the fairs, uh, we have the support that we need from the brokers. Um, we'll be confirming that as the, the fairs roll out. Call center hours. So we listed them. Uh, it's a little change from what was prior. As of 12, 16, it's eight to six. And they will, will be closing early for Christmas Eve. I'd say with New Year's Eve. And then also there's a couple Saturdays that they'll be open. Um, and those are the same Saturdays that our fairs are going on. And then also on the 15th of January, the last day of open enrollment will be open eight to eight at the call center. Any questions? Thank you, Deb. Um, now we do have a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time and I'd be happy to review them for your answers. Um, one that came through early was, uh, the question is, will all applications from this point have the 2-1-2020 start date? Yes, anything after 12-16 would have a 2-1 effective date. Terrific, and I would imagine it's gonna be important for everyone to let the consumer know and remind them that the, their coverage yes. begins then. Okay, terrific. When will we be assigned enrollment centers and fairs to work? This must be from brokers. So that information went out with our communication on Monday, letting um, the community partners know that we had an extension. We had invites to the fairs and then also the, there was an invite link to the um, libraries as well as the um, navigator site. So that's, that's gone out. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, someone shares with us that uh, one of the main issues that they uh, deal with applicants, when applicants call them, it's that they've been given their application ID number, they should be given their username and temporary password. Uh, the, the person asking the question says, I know in some cases they do not have one, but in most cases they do. The applicant then has to call back Access Health Connecticut to get that info. I can speak to that. So we have done um, several different training and huddles at the call center so that the agents know they are to provide the user ID and the password. And also in the opening of their conversation with the consumer, they're to ask if the consumer knows if they have an account or if they've gone into their account lately. So it's, it's a bunch of different prompts and questions that they do, they're supposed to go out with. And I know it's not helpful just for the um, agent to pass on to the application number so they are supposed to do the user id and password or reset the password if the consumer doesn't remember their password but that has been uh, additional training and we keep refreshing that training with the call center so they provide the appropriate information to the brokers when they give out broker names okay terrific um the next question that came through um earlier says is it possible to have documents that are available for downloading or printing in the customer portal to print or show 
with a date and timestamp, particularly those items in the inbox, such as letters, et cetera. Hmm. So they're, they're looking for when they send, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. So sure. they're looking that when they send their documents that it gets timestamped as it comes in? It looks like it. Documents that are available for downloading or printing in the customer portal. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm going to have to take that one back because I'm not sure, sure exactly what that process yeah. is as far as when they indicate it, it came in and the date it came in. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to further research that one. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Shelly's got some. Yeah, Shelly. Hi, everyone. This is Shelly. So what I can offer is that if you upload something directly to your account, it does provide us timestamp at the time of upload. But if you're having to mail it in, it's hard to track the exact date. Our scanning center may have received it. So if that's what you're worried about, we may not have a timestamp associated with that with the mailer. But with an upload through the account, there is a timestamp associated with that action. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I see that we have a few questions that have been submitted through the chat box, and um, I'd like to look them through for a moment. Um, here's one, uh, and, and thank you for, for the detail from everyone. I have had a number of applicants that were losing Husky coverage at the end of the month. After they talked to Access Health Connecticut and called me to help them pick a plan, when I clicked on enroll coverage, it tells me they qualify but need to enroll between 1231.19 and 229.20. It does not allow them to pick a plan now. In the past, when this has happened, they end up being effective the next day. Why do they have to wait until the last day of the month? It has probably happened six or seven times during this past year. So this is Shelly again. We actually answered this in the chat box, but just for everyone's knowledge, this is a system glitch that happens at times. It's not all the time. As you can see in his example, six or seven times during the past year. We're not sure, we don't have the root cause. However, if you submit the escalation to our team, whether you're a broker or CAC, send it to the um, correct support inbox and we can do an override to make sure that the client gets the best or the requested effective date that they're interested in. Terrific. Thank you. And thank you, Shelly. I see that you have provided some of the answers and the information in the chat box so that people can review it on their own as well. Um, uh, let's see what else we have here. For a consumer that is already enrolled in the 2020 plan but wants to change plans, what is the change box that should be checked? If the only change they want is to change plans. I I was wondering the same because it doesn't really speak to the extension. So So because we are out of regular open enrollment, the three options you would typically see are not going to show up. So when you go for a report change, you're going to have to trigger by checking one of the boxes. Most times people check off a demographic change. This could be to an address. In most cases, we see people go in and make a change to something simple like the word street abbreviated to st or avenue spell it out from the abbreviation just to push the application through to get the determination so that you can open up the shopping streets again Perfect. unfortunately there's no easy way to do it at the moment on the consumer side so that is your best bet unless you want to submit it to one of our support inboxes terrific um one more question we have. Letters to consumers can be very confusing, and I know that we have heard this before. Indicating a selection needs to be made and then check mark indicating selection made. Is there a clarification? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure, I'll repeat it. Letters to consumers can be very confusing. Indicating a selection needs to be made and then a check mark indicating selection made. I think, yeah. I think generally what it may be saying is if we're looking for additional information, it'll give options of what we're still looking for, but I don't believe there's a checkbox yeah. that they would check off anything. 
but sometimes it's hard to understand which piece of information they're still looking for. But that's, I, I'm not sure of any checkbox. So if, if, if we clarity on what, what actual form they're talking or what number on the form, maybe we could look into it a little bit further. So if you want to submit a question or a concern about a particular notice, just so that we can follow the conversation, there is a notice number associated with everything that we send out. It's four digits at the bottom, bottom left corner of all, the, of all the communications that we send out. You might see 1301, 1304, 1302. If you grab that and then submit your concerns to uh, our, e our team via email, we can give you a better explanation at about what you're looking at. It's hard to speak to it if we don't know exactly the notice you're, you're referring to. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Uh, we have one other question from this one from a new broker. If we participate in one of the fairs, do we get to enroll the clients into our book of business or is it simply a volunteer exercise? So if you've attended a fair, yes, you can tangle with those consumers that you've met with at the fairs or in the navigator sites. And yes, those, those would be definitely your consumers entangled and receive commission on those. Very good. Um, I'm looking for any additional ones. When clients have missing documents requested on their inbox, is there a list of what kind of documents specifically would be considered proof? Yeah, it looks like... Um, Can you read that one more time? Absolutely. When clients have missing documents requested on their inbox, is there a list of what kind of documents specifically would be considered proof? So what the client can do is if they go into their inbox, they can look at all the notices that they would have received. There's a digital copy available to them. So that notice in particular is 1304. And if you open up that document, it will provide you a list of all the acceptable items for the missing documentation that's in question. So 1304 is for VCL. Great. All right. Um, I have two clients that I'm getting an error message number 3074. When I call member services, I submitted a ticket, but it's not resolved. I need to know if there's another number I can call. Do we recognize that error number? Not on the top of our heads, mm -hmm. but the best bet so that we can look at the application specifically, whether, I'm not sure if this is a broker or not. If you are a broker, please submit this issue to our inbox at AHCT, brokersupport at ct.gov. We'll put it in the chat box so that everyone can see it. Reference the application number and the client name, and just walk us through what happened leading up to the error code so that we can investigate it further. Again, that email address is AHCT, brokersupport at ct.gov. AHCT, brokersupport at ct.gov. Yes. And in most cases, if you're getting an error message, screenshot or snip the error message. That also is helpful when we are doing our investigation on our side. Wonderful. All right. Um, still looking for other questions. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback and your questions along the way. Um, if we were unable to tangle due to broker or consumer portal system issues, but are able to enter our broker number on the worker portal, does it still go into their book of business? Okay, <laughs> this is Shelly. Dear brokers, there are two ways to associate yourself with a client account. The formal way and the best way is to tangle through the client's consumer account so that they can see you under their manage my assistance option. Now, if you're experiencing issues, the backup is to just add your name in the field towards the end of the application that says, who is assisting you today? And you put in your number there. I would advise though, if you can, and most likely you should, send that application ID, that client account information to our team so that we can make sure we close the loop and get you tangled properly. The reason being, if you simply just add your name to the application, there's a chance that you can be removed for whatever reason. So in most cases, if possible, you want to do the formal tangle through the consumer portal. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, my next question available here is, when we help applicants enroll outside of open enrollment, can we charge a fee since we do not receive any commission for these applicants? Yes. You have to make sure that the consumer understands that, and you also have to have a specific license to do that. But we all, I mean, we advertise for free um, help, and so we prefer that if they're a consumer through us, that you make sure that you tell them up front that you're going to charge a fee for special enrollment events. All right, excellent. Um, still reviewing all of the questions. Are there any that um, I may have missed? And okay, the next question I have says, are brokers compensated for clients who we enroll in Husky? If so, what is the compensation? No, there's no compensation for right. the social service consumers. Yep. Got it. So the answer is no, no compensation for Husky clients. Um, I want to give everybody a quick reminder on the group chat. Can I just add to that? Sure. Because I think this over a little bit. So those consumers may have someone in the household that eventually may go on a Q QHP or they may have a split household. So um, depending on the situation in that household, for the broker's perspective, it might be um, it, it might might be a business that you get down the road if those consumers convert over from um, Husky to a QHP or there's a split household. Got it. Excellent. All right. I want to remind everyone that as you see in your chat box, we are giving you the information uh, for the email addresses to reach out to Broker Support Inbox. Again, that one being access AHCT Broker Support at ct.gov. And for the CACs, the support inbox is ird.outreach at ct.gov. Um, one individual uh, who's participating asked us what was the enrollment goal for December 15 and what was actually achieved. Hmm. We may not have that information just yet. She's yeah. yeah, we will put those a link to the, the stats, the current stats for mm -hmm. as of this date. All right, um, I'm gonna have one more question. Okay. Okay, and um, another question that did come through is why do consumers that we are connected with not show up in the search portal? Hello, this is Shelly again. Hi, Shelly. <laughs> so over the past few weeks, we've been receiving examples of this instance for brokers, and there, there could be a variety of reasons. Your client may have moved on to a different broker through open enrollment, the first half of open enrollment. That could be one case. Your client may not have an active enrollment anymore, so we're finding that that is also a cause for it not showing up in your book of business on the broker portal. I have yet to identify all the root causes, but if you find any instance where you're missing a client, please submit to us in specifically with that individual's um, information so that we can look into it. Uh, case by case because it could be for a variety of reasons. So I don't want to send out a blanket statement for um, the reason that this is happening. So brokers, you know the email, send it in, application ID, client name, so that we can look into it specifically. Okay, terrific. I think that, uh, you know, we've had a great conversation today. I really appreciate everyone's time and participation. Uh, Access Health Connecticut, thanks you for your time. Um, and uh, we are going to, there may be other questions that do come through. We'll make sure that we sort of look at them and be able to publish information uh, as easily as possible for everyone uh, to understand. Uh, I will keep the chat box open for perhaps a minute or so to make sure that uh, if we have other exchanges of information, we can complete that. And um, other than that, I uh, will close today's webinar.
and the so, webinar will be out on the website. That's right. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, understand that this webinar uh, is fully recorded, will be made available to you on the website so that anyone can review it, uh, listen and watch it as we did it today. All right? So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone again. Really appreciate your time and participating in these exchanges of information. They help everyone uh, do the best job that we can for our consumers. And so let's have a good and successful open enrollment extension. And with that, I'll say goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you.